Good afternoon. It is 3.05, March 9th, 2022. The Education Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. We do have a quorum. We have four bills up today. One, two, yep, four. Everybody will love these. Uh, we're going to uh, switch the... Uh, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Senator Duckworth will go first, and then uh, Senator Bingham will go in second with Senate File 3173. So, Senator Duckworth, I just thought of a joke, but I won't say it. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Something about ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. um, so, Senate File 3373, Senator Duckworth, uh, you, and I, it looks like you don't have any amendments? That's correct. All right. Well, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I'll be short and sweet. Uh, you may be familiar with um, uh, AP courses, advanced placement courses that take place in many of our high schools across the state of Minnesota, as well as international baccalaureate programs. They're a little bit different, but their aims are really very similar, and that is to help our mostly high school students in the state of Minnesota take courses and follow on exams that would allow them to potentially qualify to receive college credits, whether they go on to attend a state institution here in the state or a private institution, depending upon whether or not they'll accept those based on certain scores, um, et cetera. Uh, the the uh, Cambridge Assessment International Education is a very similar program, very similar assessment uh, to the AP uh, courses as well as the IB programs. And this bill would allow them to also um, you know, partner with schools within the state of Minnesota to have it be another means or more options by which students could qualify uh, for credit that could carry on to their higher education, uh, potentially at their uh, college level education. So with that being said, Mr. Chair, I do have a, a testifier here I would love to turn it over to who can explain this in more detail. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. And is it Sherry Reach? I'm trying to find you up here. All right. Sherry Reach, you're up there, right? Do you, does anybody see her up there? Maybe I'm flying solo, I don't know. <laughs> so, we'll keep uh, it even more short and sweet, Mr. Chair. All right, so, um, members, any questions about this? Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Sen uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, I. I have a couple of questions. Like, um, first of all, how um, or where did you come up with this this new alternative to the program? Like, how did you were you were you, did you participate in it? Do you know somebody that yeah. participated? Well, Mr. Senator Chair, Duckworth. Uh, first off, I appreciate that question, um, and uh, I consider it to be a, another option, not necessarily uh, an alternative or a replacement to AP or, or IB, but just another option that students could utilize. I myself in high school uh, took several AP classes and benefited tremendously. I, I think I ended up at the University of St. Thomas with almost a semester or a year's worth of credits that carried over due to my, uh, particip my participation and completion of AP courses. Um, Lakeville schools, I happen to represent them, uh, have a tremendous uh, adoption rate or participation in AP courses. IB is, uh, International Baccalaureate is not as prevalent across the state as AP is, uh, but so this would just be adding another option to students and schools across the state that they could uh, explore and implement uh, should they choose to do so. Senator Hello. Kunish? Yes. So I know that um, Cambridge is, you know, pretty exclusive uh, school over in, in England. And from what I understand um, from this company, they maintain more of an international standard. And so when they uh, have these, these um, AP classes that have maybe an international twist or flavor to it, um, how, how do we make sure that, that those are going to meet the needs of our students here in Minnesota? Um, from what I understand, they can um, create their own independent courses and they have the freedom to set their exam structure. So how do we make sure that that matches the um, maybe, you know, the standards that we have here in Minnesota and that our students maybe not having that, expo um, that um, 
experience internationally or exposure to uh, the way that things are done or said or written in, in uh, outside of Minnesota, how are they going to meet those, those needs for our students? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Kunis, you bring up a good point. The, the Cambridge assessment is much more similar to the International Baccalaureate program than it is AP courses. That being said, uh, this isn't mandating or instituting that a school district would have to offer these courses to their students. It would simply say they, they have the ability to do so. So I would leave it up to them at their level to determine whether or not they want to offer the courses if they see them as a good fit for their students. Oftentimes these are taken as electives, so it's above and beyond what's required to graduate, or sometimes a district might determine, hey, this course does meet some of the state requirements. So it would largely be up to the freedom of to be up to the freedom and flexibility of the districts and the students to determine whether or not they want to take the course, why they want to take the course, and uh, whether or not it would carry over into potential college credit. Um, just a side note, you know, any additional uh, exposure, whether it's internationally or nationally, we can give students regarding their education. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity if, if they choose to pursue it. And just one more follow-up. Sure, Senator and Kunish. So um, here it says the commissioner shall pay all examination fees for all public and non-public schools uh, at, for of law, uh, low income families as defined by the commissioner. Do you know if there's a cost differentiation between um, like Cambridge or these different other programs that we're already using? So is there, is there a cost that's, that might be um, connected to this. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Kunish. Typically, uh, there is a cost to take the exam. So when I took my AP courses, uh, which I will say was maybe not that long ago, um, uh, there was a cost incurred. However, the state did contribute some toward the cost of that test. Um, they do so for AP exams, for example. This doesn't necessarily obligate the state to do that when it comes to the Cambridge assessment uh, tests. However, that is something that could be explored in the future. Um, Chair. It Senator does Kunish. say that the commissioner shall pay all examination fees. So that means that the commission that the state would have to pay those fees for low income families. So there you know I don't know that it's optional uh, or not except based on income. But I'm wondering if because this is an international uh, organization if there's a price differentiation to what we are paying now. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, uh, I don't know if the the costs are the same or not, depending upon if you're taking an AP assessment or a Cambridge assessment or an international baccalaureate assessment. I would assume there's some differences in the cost. Uh, I just don't know what those differences are offhand. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm done. Uh, we the testifier is now with us, Ms. Oh, Sherry Reach. You may uh, uh, just state your name and who you're with for the record. You can start. Yep. Apologies, I apologize for that. It's all right. Go ahead. Thank you so much, um, Senator Chamberlain. I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts and information about the Cambridge program. I just wanted to let everyone know that perhaps has not had an opportunity to learn about Cambridge prior to today, that we are actually a division of the University of Cambridge in England, which does provide a world-class education system for all students. Um, we are backed by more than 150 years of leading research and assessment practices. And the Cambridge program offers the only program of study with credit by exam connected to a renowned higher education institution. And that, of course, is the University of Cambridge. The academically rigorous curriculum emphasizes critical thinking and inquiry-based learning, engaging all students' development of cross-curricular knowledge and skills that lead to success in college and beyond. Cambridge International is the world's largest provider of international education programs. We serve over 10,000 schools in over 160 countries. The program offers a grades K through 12 pathway that actually started in the United States back in 1995 and has significantly grown to partner with schools across 35 states in the United States and the District of Columbia. We are now leading the world in the United States with schools in these 35 states that are um, offering these courses and these examinations to a degree that outnumbers all of those in other countries. So the Cambridge provi sorry, program provides an aligned instructional system that includes the curriculum, teacher training on the pedagogy, 
and end of course assessments, which are written and graded in Cambridge for over 120 high school courses. 50 of those 120 courses are considered to be college equivalent and successful performance on those end of course exams can earn college credit in higher education. Statewide credit by exam policies for Cambridge advanced exams passed are in place now in seven states. They include Florida, Indiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and the state of Washington. These credit by exam policies and also policies which include subsidized exam fees for Cambridge and our exam fees are on par with what AP and IB exam fees are, by the way. Um, they are actually able to help students know that they have access to rigorous coursework because the schools will be able to afford to actually offer these programs, having subsidized exam fees available for them from their states and also having grants available to schools and districts that want to start up new advanced academic programs. So those are very, very important policies to increase access and equity for all students in all states. So with your support, we are hoping that students in Minnesota who have earned qualifying scores on Cambridge advanced end of course exams will have clarity on what they can actually earn in colleges in Minnesota for their work and performance. And they will also be able to pursue a degree in higher education at a reduced cost as a result of having these supporting policies. I would also like to mention that um, not only will students in Minnesota benefit from policies that you may adopt, but also students outside of Minnesota to include international students who are looking for um, options of where to attend for higher education degrees, they will be looking at Minnesota as well. And we do have a website that publishes for free access to all policies that are from all states so that people all over the world in those 160 countries can quickly look and see what are the policies in Minnesota as well as other states. So that would be beneficial to everybody just to provide more clarity to the students in Minnesota in the future and also those outside of Minnesota that would like to come to Minnesota. Um, we do appreciate that um, we have an opportunity to share information about this program. And I wanted you to know that we've already engaged with conversations with many Minnesota stakeholders just to inform them about the Cambridge program and what all it entails and includes and the quality of what we are offering. And some of these stakeholders that we've already been engaging with include members of the Minnesota Department of Education, the Governor's Office, the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, several state senators to include some of you, some of you in this meeting, thank you, and some representatives. Um, I just wanna conclude by saying that your support for um, SR3373 would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much and I'd be happy to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you, Mrs. Ms. Reach. <clears throat> Members, any other questions? Good. Senator Duckworth, any final comments? No, she did a much better job than I did, so I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Reach. Um, we are going to lay this over. Senate file 3373, it will be laid over. And we have to, I guess there's part of a fiscal note we got to get to. So thank you, Senator Duckworth. Thank you. Next up, Senator Bingham is moving up. Senate file 3173. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'll move the A1. Oh, hang on there a second. Mr. Chair, while you're shuffling through those papers, I just want to embarrass Senator Bigham and tell everybody that it's her birthday today. Thank you. Happy birthday. 
Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Senator Weger. <laughs> now we're ready to go. Senate File 3173, Senator Bingham. Yep. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Senate file 3173 as amended um, is, a, I guess I'm going to say kind of a, a labor of unconditional love. Um, over the last year I've gotten to know um, Ms. Noring who is going to be testifying um, through a, a tragedy of her son uh, who passed due to fentanyl poisoning. And we have sat in the community of Hastings, meaning myself and Representative Jurgens, who's co-authoring this in the Senate, um, to meet with residents, students, passionate stakeholders um, to address this epidemic that is going on, not only in our community, but across the state. And one of the things that has come out of this is um, the schools are, are, playing, are gonna play a role in this to educate our children, to educate parents, um, in the uh, evils and the, um, the harms of illegal drugs and distribution of such. Um, so through discussion uh, and the brilliance of uh, my legislative assistant, um, we were able to come up with Senate File 3173 that strongly encourages uh, schools um, at least once to students in grades uh, six through eight to provide substance misuse awareness and prevention instruction. And part of that substance uh, use awareness and prevention instruction would include the role of social media, Mr. Chair. And what you'll hear um, from uh, Ms. Noreen is uh, about how uh, Snapchat played a terrible role in, um, in this situation and many others. Um, across the state. And then also it's strongly encouraged, schools are strongly encouraged to provide um, substance abuse, misuse awareness, prevention and instruction uh, to students in grades nine through 12 as well. And it's also encouraging the schools to use peer-to-peer -peer education program to provide um, the awareness and instruction. And I do want to thank um, my co-authors of Senator Hoffman, Abler, Weger, and Isaacson. Uh, I want to thank my uh, House partner, uh, Representative Jurgens, and um, want to turn it over. There are three letters in here in the in the packet for for members, but um, just want to turn it over to uh, who I call an incredible friend, advocate, uh, and just a tremendous person, Miss Noreen. We had, uh, I forgot, we got to move your author's amendment. Your A1 author's amendment has that strongly encouraged to yes. language. Yes. Um, so members, A1 author's amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay, now we have the testifier. Is she online? Okay, Bridget, it's Bridget Noring. Bridget Noring. So uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please uh, state your name and who you're with for the record. You may begin. Thank you, Sir Chair, committees, members, um, Senator Bigham. Um, my name is Bridget Noring. On April 4, 2020, my 19-year-old son, Devin Noring, was found by his younger brother, Caden, unresponsive in his bed. Um, through the course of the investigation, we found out that Devin and the young man who was with the night before had gone on Snapchat purchased what they thought was a Percocet, but instead it turned out to be 100% pure fentanyl. That one pill had enough fentanyl in it to kill over 10 people. Um, since Devin passed away, we have lost here in Hastings over seven, seven young adults. So this is <coughs> something that's a very serious matter here, not just here, but across the state. Um, but one of the things in helping raise awareness, we have Senator Begum, Representative Jurgen supporting our community, introducing <laughs> bills such as SF3173. But we also have our local United Way backing us and, and getting our community members to the table and helping raise awareness. But the one key piece that we're not able to really get through, and not just here, but other communities, is our schools. Um, we've been told that some schools don't offer 
substance use or misuse education. Um, others won't because parents may not want their kids to have that education. Um, and others have to do things outside of school, after school hours, and doing doing things outside of school after hours, it, it really puts our kids at a tremendous risk. Those who are vulnerable to these drug dealers might not get there. They won't get that education. They won't receive that awareness. So that's why it's super important that we get our schools involved. You know, Minnesota, we lost in 2020, we lost over a thousand lives. 654 of those were opioid related. 593 of those were a result of fentanyl. My son is one of those numbers. Um, I've come to know mothers whose 15 year old, 13 year old children are part of that 593 number. Um, and these are preventable. These are preventable. Just having that conversation, opening that door. Our students here in Hastings, just sitting down with them, they want to know what, what is killing their friends. What what can they do? How do they stop? Where do they go for help? Why are the schools not teaching us this? Especially our senior students. They have expressed that they're going to be leaving for college. Teach us what's out there so we know what to expect. I mean, if we're not educating our children, it puts them at a higher risk of turning to these substances. You know, they have no idea. You know, a friend of a friend, here, it's, let's try this, or, you know, this is fun. They're not understanding that that one time is literally going to be the last time. They're not getting a second chance because of the fentanyl. Um, so for us, it's all about saving as many lives as we can. And right now we really need everybody on deck, especially our schools. So I, I, I mean, it, it's really sad. It's unfortunate that this is happening. So I, I do. I thank you, Senator Bingham. You, you've been amazing, and I appreciate you introducing this bill and giving me the opportunity, Sir Chair. I thank you for having me today. Thank you, Miss Noring. Um, members, any questions for Senator? Senator Isaacson. I uh, just want to say that uh, <clears throat> the power of uh, testimony like that and the effort um, on her part to take what is so painful and try to make that better for the people is something I really appreciate. And I hope that uh, something we take seriously and my heart and thoughts go out with her and anybody else that's suffering because I know that once addiction gets hold, it can be a real horrible experience and for families it's really tough and all the love to Bridget and her family as they continue to navigate this world. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Senator Kunish. Thank you Mr. Chair and thank you um, Senator Bigum and thank you to our testifier for sharing your very painful story. The very first bill that I carried when I was in the house was to do just this was to create uh, an educational awareness program. I had a mom that came to me. Uh, she had a program all ready to go. It was called For Jake's Sake. And I worked that bill and I tried as hard as I could. That was six years ago. So imagine what we've missed in six years um, because we haven't passed something, uh, a piece of legislation um, such as this one. The, the information that we can provide to our schools and to our students is valuable. And there are folks that are uncomfortable with it or say not in my town or not in my house. But right now I'm dealing with two families, two different families who lost their sons to fentanyl just the way that you did. And it is, it is a pandemic like nothing we've ever seen and it absolutely uh, is Im imperative that we educate kids not only on the do's and the don'ts and the dangers, but also uh, what to do when you are with somebody that takes something such as, as a fentanyl pill that is so deadly. Um, 
either a phone call or uh, an injection that could save them. We need to get that information out to these kids especially. So thank you for sharing your story and um, thank you, Senator Bigham, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Senator Bigham, do, um, um, what do our health classes do or is there still a D.A.R.E. program out there? What's going on with all that? Do you know? Mr. Chair, one, I'm a proud graduate of D.A.R.E. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it did educate students um, to a point, right? But, Mr. Chair, I'm 43 today, and so that was in the 80s. It's 2022, and we have social media. Uh, we have a lot of other things out there that kids get to be smarter than the D.A.R.E. officers uh, that were there. Um, so, um, I, you know this, I'm not a fan of unfunded mandates, so that's why this is a strongly encouraged. Um, and, um, you know, our local districts are in charge of dealing, we set the standards, but they're in charge of the exact curriculum. So what Senate File 3173 hopes to do is to take um, experiences and stories that Ms. Noreen uh, shares throughout the community. And, and I'm going to just say this, that this is, she has had such an impact statewide. Um, she has created such a network statewide of, of a group that no mother uh, wants to be part of. And her strength and her commitment and her resolve is going to bring change. I know it. Um, I have faith in this committee and in the in this state and our leaders. But um, we have to really push our school districts, Mr. Chair, to, to address this in their curriculum. That's what this bill intends to do. Thank you, uh, Senator Bingham. Well, would that, would that suffice for your closing comment? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Noring. Thank you very much for the testimony and for enduring and for working to uh, help solve a problem. Um, with that, Senator Bingham, Senate File 3173 be laid over as amended. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair and Committee. Senator, uh, did you want to, are you ready to go next? Might as well keep you third. I'll go last. So next up will be um, Senator Coleman, Senate File 3231. I don't think we have any amendments for you, do we, Senator Coleman? I don't believe so, Mr. Chair. Okay. So I think we're ready to go. So you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And do you need screen sharing um, access? I think I should. You're good. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Senate File 3231 makes permanent the increased math core funding this committee passed last session. It increases the base funding from $500,000 to $1 million starting in fiscal year 2024. As we will hear from my wonderful testifiers, unfortunately, during the pandemic, Gaps in mathematics have only widened, particularly for black, Latino, and American Indian students. The gaps in math have widened even more than the gaps in reading. As we all know from our own experience learning math, math concepts build on previously learned concepts. And if a student is struggling with early math facts, it makes it much more difficult for them to learn higher level, level skills in later grades. Math Corps has responded to requests from schools and now offers math support in grades K through three and layers early concepts in pre-K reading corps. The reality is it will take several years for our state to get all students back on track. Ensuring Math Corps' current funding level continues into the future will allow them to meet more of the needs of our students. And with that, Mr. Chair, I believe we have a brief presentation and um, a couple of testifiers as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And thank you, Senator Coleman, for offering this bill. My name is Dr. Sandy Polis, and I'm the Vice President of Equity and Inclusion at CERB Minnesota, which is the State Commission for AmeriCorps Programs. 
Today I want to talk briefly about, about our approach to improving AmeriCorps programming in the state and specifically about the value of MathCorps on improving tutoring solution. As an organization, we leverage both the committed people and resources across the state of Minnesota to address our state's critical issues, especially in the area of education. We're able to do this very well because from design to scale, our program is rooted in evidence and reflects the communities that we serve. AmeriCorps members provide service that is a known value and deliver real positive impacts across communities in Minnesota. Thanks in part to that vision for program development and the rich history of service, Serve Minnesota and our programs have been able to reach over 50,000 students in math, over 500,000 students in reading, as well as contribute to solving the teacher shortage by developing a workforce pipeline for teachers, as many of our AmeriCorps members are interested in becoming teachers. We've launched a new education pathway both starting at the community college level and at the master's level as well. We also have a robust research and development team that is committed to sharing practices nationally with different organizations from our work here in Minnesota. As Senator Coleman mentioned, uh, math scores have continued to decline since the onset of the pandemic. And this figure here shows uh, where students in the fall of 2019 began and where they performed in fall 2021. So you can see Asian students and white students started at a higher performance and saw a smaller decline in uh, academic performance in math as compared to Hispanic, Latinx, Native American and indigenous students and black students as well. So we're seeing a larger magnitude of impacts for students of color and an uh, important need to quickly address um, and improve these scores for students. So why MathCore? Well, MathCore is designed to directly address these opportunity gaps. The bottom line is, is that if you get behind in math, it's much more difficult to get caught up, especially if you get behind earlier on, right? Our program is designed to teach students both uh, whole numbers and rational numbers early on, and those skills, skills build upon each other. So we have the opportunity to create um, solutions for students right now that not only intervene and get them back on track um, within their grade level, but also help propel them to be able to take more advanced, more rigorous math courses that ultimately lead to higher access to college and more careers that are rooted in math as well. Over the last five years, MathCore has had strong and consistent effects on student achievement. Students who receive math core intervention, regardless of grade, race, or family income, outgrow students at a similar rate, or sorry, outgrow similar students at a rate that adds up to approximately a semester of growth. So this is why we strongly believe that math core is part of the solution. Because of our continued emphasis on meaningful evidence-based practices, we have received national recognition for our work. Just last month, we were selected from an international pool of over 130 applicants by the School of Business at Duke University to create our own assessment that better aligns with the students in Minnesota. MathCorp continues to receive national recognition from various institutions like the Annenberg Institute at Brown University and Proven Tutoring, which is another large-scale national organization. And it is because of these uh, proven track record that we have that we are able to partner with local community members on funding opportunities such as PNC, which funded early numeracy, so students in pre-K have access to math supports, Cargill Foundation, which also funded the expansion of K-3 math core, and then our 4-8 math core program continues to receive funding opportunities for ongoing innovation and improvements. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to, to share why Math Corps is vital for student success in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, and it's Dr. Polis, you said? Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, next, um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and who you're with for the record. You may start. Come on. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sumi Lee, and I lead community partnerships and health equity strategy at Livio Health. 
I'm also a board member of Serve Minnesota of five years where I chair the Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee. And the reason I'm here today is because I served in AmeriCorps as a Minnesota Math Corps member. When I returned to Minnesota in 2013, after living abroad for several years, I was looking for an opportunity to find my place and begin my career. Being a Math Corps member not only provided me with a career trajectory in serving my community, but also provided me with a sense of belonging in my community. I served as a Math Corps member for two years at Central Park Elementary School in Roseville School District, where I grew up. When I started my AmeriCorps service, I received rigorous training and all the tools I needed to tutor 24, 4th through 6th grade students each day. The tutoring ranged from providing diagnostic tests, tutoring each unit with engaging materials and repeated practices, and wrapping up each lesson with a unit test. Witnessing the confidence my students gained when certain math concepts clicked with them after repeated lessons and even some frustrating moments helped me see the impact my role was creating in these young lives. I'd like to share two stories that demonstrate the impact I witnessed as a Minnesota Math Corps member. One of the students I tutored got easily frustrated with math. He was familiar with most of the concepts, but when he got stuck, he would just throw up his hands and want to quit the task altogether. He struggled when his homeroom math hour came along that often showed up as behavioral issues. I'm not sure what the magic was. Um, maybe it was extra encouragements and compliments. Maybe it was the bribing of stickers to track his progress. Maybe he needed another caring adult. But after a full school year of working together, he passed his standardized grade level math test. A few years later, I ran into him and his family at an apple orchard where he recognized me from afar. His parents told me that, believe it or not, math is his favorite subject in, in high school. I couldn't have been more proud that I had played a role in shaping this young man's future. Here's my second story. My service site, Central Park Elementary School, was experiencing a swift demographic change with new Karen students joining our schools. The teachers whom I worked with and were very, very supportive of me as a math core tutor pulled me aside one day to tell me that the Karen students who recently moved to Minnesota from refugee camps across the world used to talk about how they wanted to become soldiers and TV stars, but recently they started adding in a new an additional career, career mix. They wanted to become a math teacher because of Miss Lee. It's an experience I talk about often as the chair of the Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee on the board of Serve Minnesota. Serve Minnesota is committed to creating career pathways through all of our programs and also increase diverse representation in our AmeriCorps members. A role model that looks like the students this program serves can indeed create a long lasting impact for our next generation. I'm happy to have this opportunity to share that Math Corps works. Serving my community and delivering things that actually make an impact encouraged me to stay on that career path. It's more important now than ever that we support students that could really, really use that extra help. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lee, correct, Ms. Lee? Thank you very much. Um, yes, it can work, can it? Uh, members, any questions? Senator Weaver. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Coleman, testifiers. Uh, scientifically based, you've got results and strongly support, and I, I, I wish we could do even more, and maybe we can. Uh, I'd like to see if the testifiers could also talk about the parallel with reading and with the, uh, the, the service uh, core for math core, your going to work with a student, you may have someone in your reading core working with the same student. It could be potentially the same person working with a student on both, especially with the relationship. So if you could talk about you know, dual strategies for the same student. Thank who, you. Would, who would want that one? Doctor? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator, for your question. So yes, yeah, some of our school sites do have both math core and reading core. Those are two separate AmeriCorps positions right now. Um, but some students do receive both services, um, which I think is really unique. We know that students who receive um, 
math core. Um, some students also are in need of additional reading core services. And we know that once students have strong reading core skills, strong performance in reading, um, that they do tend to see higher performance in math. We know that as you're doing math, problems, right? Reading is um, a huge part of that, and so there definitely is opportunities, or are opportunities for students to have access to both interventions. Senator Weger. So, thank you, Mr. Chair, and yeah, will we be looking at uh, additional presentation on Reading Corps? No, it's not on, uh, we got nothing in the docket. Nothing okay. in line. Yeah, but perhaps uh, there'd be that opportunity looking at the obvious linkage and strategy uh, from the experts. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Weir. Senator Kunish? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for bringing this and for sharing uh, this really good information. I personally am a big fan of reading and math core. Uh, I taught at an elementary school, inner city elementary school for close to 25 years and um, part of that towards those, those last years at the elementary school, we had reading and math core individuals in our school. And I was a library media specialist and I carved out a space in my library where they could work with the students uh, in sort of a private area. But um, so I heard and I saw the work that they did. And I heard and saw the relationships that, that were built, just as, as you were explaining, um, I could give you so many really great little stories about the encouragement and the personal connection that really did make a difference in those, in those children's lives. And so um, I, you know, I, I really think these are, these are great things because relationships do make a difference in, in educating our students. I just have one question for the author. Um, on line 1.13, it says the base year, the base for fiscal year 2024 and later is uh, $1 million. Is that, is there an end date or is this one of those, um, like there's no end date, it goes into perpetuity? Mr. Chair. Um. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Senator, for the question. I believe this makes permanent the increased funding, but I can have Senate Council um, confirm. I can, I can answer that, yes. Okay. It does. Yep. So, Mr. Chair? Senator Kunish? Would there be um, that same allotment f possibly for Reading Corps? I, I don't know, Senator Kunish. I have not just looked at that or discussed it. Um, uh, we are certainly focused on reading in this committee, uh, but I don't know. I have not... Uh, looked at it. We have not discussed it this year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Senator Coleman, wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Um, Senator Kunish, let's look into that. If there's not a bill, let's work on one. And uh, I just want to thank my testifiers. I've done tutoring in the past, and it is some of the most fulfilling work you can do, and it takes people with so much patience and dedication and care. So thank you for rolling up your sleeves and doing some of the most important work we have here in the state, and uh, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Coleman. And thank you, testifiers. Yes, vitally important uh, math, reading, reading, math. I think they go hand in hand. Thank you very much. So with that, Senate file 3231 will be laid over. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Now, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Senator Eichhorn. All right, Senate file 3843, Senator Chamberlain, do you have any amendments? No amendments. All right, to the bill. Senate file 3843 um, came about after our discussion, uh, what was it, a week ago? Yeah, February 28th, no, it was, a, it was about a week ago, yeah. February 28th, about some confusion regarding higher ed prep for teacher programs. So what this does is we just decided to insert uh, 
letters into the current statute saying that, um, as you can see on the back, line 2.3 requires teacher candidates to receive instruction using the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling program. So we want to make it clear that, um, no, we can make it clear that our teachers need to get this to be classroom ready. It can be this program, it could, we could talk about what it needs to be, but we believe that the statute need clarifying to make perfectly clear that our uh, teacher prep programs need to do this for our teachers in those schools. Um, when they be, so when they get to the schools, they're ready to go. Um, uh, secondly, during some testimony uh, earlier in February about the letters grant that we had proposed, uh, I believe Caitlin Schneider from Education Minnesota thought uh, it would be a good idea to include candidates as eligible applicants for the letters grant. And in a way this makes it so uh, that they'll get this uh, in the prep school without any question. So that's the bill, some clarity on the um, letters program and prep for uh, teachers in college programs before, so they're classroom ready. I, that's all I got. All right, perfect. I see two testifiers. We have Matt Shaver up first. Welcome to state your name for the record. Members of the committee, um, Chair Eichhorn, Senator Chamberlain, my name is Matt Shaver. I'm the policy director at Ed Allies. Um, I'm actually here today more with uh, my teacher hat on um, to, to share a few thoughts about this bill. So um, I'm a tier four elementary education uh, licensed teacher in the state. I went to Concordia College in, in Moorhead for my undergrad and got my elementary education license there uh, with a concentration in communication, arts, and literacy. And then uh, just got my master's degree in urban education in curriculum pedagogy and schooling uh, from Metro State University in Minnesota. Um, and in preparation for uh, speaking on the bill, I, I wanted to check back and make sure that my memory aligned with the reality of what my undergraduate experience was. So I took a, uh, a somewhat unpleasant uh, look back at my college transcripts, my undergraduate transcripts. Um, and uh, where it was confirmed for me that I had more credits in elementary, um, in, in elementary music, art, and PE than I did in the foundations of literacy uh, in my undergrad preparation. So I had, I had eight, eight credits in music, art, and PE, and two credits in uh, the foundations of, of literacy. And before I go any further, I, I'm not bringing that up to say that art or uh, music or PE aren't important. If you're an elementary teacher, you're spending most of your day with your kids and you, you better be incorporating movement and music and art, otherwise it's gonna be a really long day. Um, but what I'll say is um, I spent a lot of time as an elementary teacher, uh, both in this state and Massachusetts, um, teaching students who were struggling um, with reading. And, and my biggest takeaways from my undergrad preparation program um, were, were beliefs that were, that were taught to me uh, that, that reading was largely a natural process and that kids over time would, would figure it out. Uh, that it was my job as their teacher to be really enthusiastic about literacy and reading. And it was to make sure that we had a diverse um, library uh, in, our, in our classroom. And um, I spent, like a lot of teachers do, um, hundreds and hundreds of dollars out of my own pocket uh, building a classroom library that reflected the students' um, experiences and, and communities and ethnicities that, that they brought into our classroom because I wanted to make sure that they saw themselves in the books that um, we were reading and that we had there. Um, and one of the best um, times of the month, every month, was when we'd get these Amazon boxes full of books that, that I picked out for kids and, and during tutoring time and during our drop everything and read time, I'd invite kids over to my U table and say, come check out these new books, find a book that you're excited about and let's go read that. And you know, the, the look on my you know, fifth graders' faces to see um, books with athletes that they recognize or great sci-fi or, or graphic novels or um, you know, Jason Reynolds' book, uh, and they'd say, you know, can I, can I take this and read this? And I'd say, of course, I'm excited that you're excited about a book. Um, and I'd watch them walk over to their desk and open up that book to the first page. And their body language changed and their faces changed when they recognized they could not read every word on that page. And that haunts me um, to this day. It really does. And to feel like as an elementary teacher, I didn't know what to do to help them. 
I was doing everything I thought I was supposed to do, right? Be enthusiastic. These kids will figure it out as they go. Get the books that, that represent them. Um, and I think about those kids now uh, quite a bit uh, these years later. And so um, I, the, other, the other piece I think is important here is I've, I've got probably like $45,000 in student loans, uh, federal, federal student loans. Um, and I think about what I got for that investment. And it w what I did get was a pathway into the classroom to be able to serve my kids. And I'm grateful for that. But I would hope for that same investment the state could, could have provided me with the training that I needed to feel successful and so that my kids could feel successful. Um, and, you know, the last two things I'd say is just this isn't entirely teacher preparation program's fault. This is entirely the legislator's fault. This isn't teacher's fault. I, but I would encourage everybody um, to pick up their part of the rope and start pulling in the same direction um, on this because it's too important. And um, the, the last piece here is uh, the start date for this, this bill is 2026. And so I think about the students who would benefit from this are the ones who are in high school right now, who through the last couple of years of being upended through the pandemic, still decide they want to be teachers. And I think we owe them better than what I got in my undergrad program. Um, thank you all for your time, and thank you for your um, public service to our state. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Senator Isaacson. Sure. Um, Mr. Shaver, uh, Senator Isaacson has one quick question for you, then we'll go on to the next testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions. One. Uh, are you saying that in all of your 120 some credits, you only had 10 credits that were towards the pedagogy of teaching at elementary school at Concordia? Mr. Shaver? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Isaacson, no. I'm okay. saying I, I had two credits in foundations of, of literacy. Got it. Yeah. A lot more, a lot so other we're credits. We're not indicting a cobber here is what I want to know. No, Because no, I'm happy sir. to indict a cobber if we have to. I just want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. So. Well, all right. I got a lot of love, sir, uh, for, for my undergrad program and, and a lot of respect for my professors. Um, but yes, absolutely. Thank you. Was that it, Senator Isaacson? All right. So we've got Laura, Laura Mogelson, and she's online. Welcome to the committee. Just state your name for the record and go ahead and get started. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Laura Mogelson, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, or MACTI regarding adding letters training as a requirement for teacher candidates in Senate File 3843. To be very clear, we know that reading is at the core of teaching and learning. We're deeply concerned about reading and we want to work collaboratively to solve this problem and we welcome the discussion. We're supportive of teaching reading systematically and explicitly using comprehensive scientifically based reading instruction doing so aligns to the standards that we must meet in our programs. The reading standards are robust, as we shared at the February meeting, and detail what teacher preparation programs must teach. Teaching children to read requires that teachers are knowledgeable and prepared, and that they continue to develop their knowledge. Letters, as a specific commercial curriculum, it's an in-depth professional development that works directly to connect the content to the teacher's classroom and to the teacher's students. It was not designed for use with teacher candidates. Letters is job embedded professional learning. It's an advanced training paired with classroom-based coaching. It allows teachers to add to their reading instruction methodologies and it's typically paired with very intentional instructional coaching and administrative support at a school-wide level. I, I want to make a, an important note about the dyslexia legislation because there's a thread that is connecting all of this. That, that was passed in 2019 and it went into effect in 2020. So this legislation will be embedded into our reading standards following the rulemaking process. And all providers were, provided, were required to submit updated syllabi to PELSB that incorporated the greater focus on intervention, remediation, and dyslexia specifically. Updates to courses to meet the requirements involved consultation with our MDE dyslexia specialists, specialist, and more detailed language in these areas will certainly appear in the updated standards the next time the reading standards themselves go through the rulemaking process. So, with that, we're, we're not supportive 
of mandating letters specifically as a requirement for teacher prep providers. It's not appropriate for the reasons I outlined above, nor is it reasonable to require that providers buy a commercial professional development curriculum for use in their programs. Um, who would pay for it, how would ongoing costs be sustained. These are not addressed in the bill, so this adds to our concerns. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. That concludes our testifiers. Is there any questions from members for Senator Chamberlain or the testifiers? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Icorn. It's not so much a question as it is just uh, some comments. Um, I want to thank Mr. Schaefer for coming in and sharing very candidly, openly, and transparently about his experience uh, becoming a teacher and what he experienced in the classroom. I thought it to be very enlightening um, and very much underscores, I think, the value in this bill or considering how we can help uh, bring literacy uh, to the, the classroom in, in colleges as folks are becoming teachers. Uh, when I was in elementary school, which was in the great state of Iowa, please don't hold that against me, uh, in about first or second grade, I started getting pulled out of the classroom uh, to meet with somebody in a much smaller group uh, because I didn't know it at the time, but I wasn't keeping up with reading. Uh, it was because of that. It's number one, because somebody noticed that I wasn't keeping up and then uh, addressed how I, could how I could catch up and brought to bear the skill set I needed to catch up with reading and with literacy. Uh, and that's why, thankfully, it became a strength of mine moving forward. So, uh, Senator Chamberlain, I appreciate the bill. I think the sooner we can begin to get great tools in front of teachers or future teachers on how they can help our kids with their literacy needs um, is uh, an endeavor that is certainly worthwhile. And I greatly appreciate that and the, uh, the sentiment that was shared by Mr. Schaefer as well. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions here. Um, we understand your, your uh, passion for the letters program and the success that it, that program has provided um, in other states and other districts. Uh, this is a privately owned business. It's a private entity parent company is a New York-based private equity firm. And I'm wondering how comfortable we should all be with um, mandating, first of all, that this is uh, going to be the literacy program and run by it in our state by a private entity, but also um, the, the mandate that now they are going to be uh, embedded in our, in our uh, colleges and universities and uh, eventually, you know, sort of having a monopoly on literacy instruction in our state. So I'm wondering if the chair, if uh, the author would address that. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish. I am perfectly willing to chat about how we can get this addressed. Uh, and I would like Pelsby and MACT to call my office, talk to Judy over there and set up a time and we can bring some people together and figure out how we're going to get this done. Because it's clear, we want to have a conversation and we just want to find out how we can get this done and get the educators what they need uh, before they enter the classroom. <laughs> Whether it's letters or something else, uh, I agree. I don't like doing the mandate, but as a friend and a colleague had mentioned to me earlier today, in a conversation with some others, sometimes you get a little weary of, of the normal path and you become a little less elegant at uh, trying to uh, obtain your goal. Uh, what we don't need is um, more, uh, uh, you know, we don't need years of study. We don't need a lot of PhDs sitting around a table and putting out another lengthy report. I think we could all agree to that. What we need is uh, clear, it's clear what we need, very clear. So I'm willing to sit down and chat with anybody about putting some language in here that's going to get this done. And as Mr. Shaver said, uh, uh, before 2026, it's just a number in there, but um, I'd like to get it done somehow, some way. I think we all would. We had to make it clear that 
one, Pell's be asked to monitor these programs and if there's some clarity we need for them and for higher ed and for us, then let's do that. I'm willing to do that. Senator Kunish. Thank you. Uh, well, I, that didn't really answer my question. I would have liked to have heard from you, from uh, you know, your point of view, how you thought that that was, that was a reasonable use of our taxpayers' dollars. On top of the $30 million that you would like to sort of hand over to this, this privately owned company, you now want to um, put more money into their pocket, and, and that's all good. And I'm wondering if there are, uh, are you aware of any other programs, maybe Minnesota-based programs, that might be able to do the same service where we could uh, support Minnesota-based organizations, maybe like the Reading Center Rochester, Orton, Gillingham Reading Specialist, and Edina, and, and put that money into uh, Minnesota and invest that way. Is that ever been an option as you look at um, how we address the literacy issue? Senator Chamberlain? Um. I think a good use of taxpayer dollars is to get our educators what they need to teach our kids to read in the classroom. And I thought I thought I answered your question. I don't care uh, where. All I care about is the, to support a program that is clearly understood, not only to teach the fundamentals of how to teach reading. Letters has proven to do that. If there's another program, another process out there, I'm happy to listen to it and happy to do whatever it is and put that program in. But it's been 20 years, over 20 years since the National Council on Reading. It's been 10 years since this has been in the books. So come forward with an idea that shows teachers how to teach reading and make sure that the higher ed is doing it and Pelsby's making sure the higher ed's doing it. I'm willing to be a partner. I don't care which program it is, but it's gotta have the letters, fundamental concepts of letters so they can go out and teach reading. There's only one way to teach reading. Um, and it's this, uh, the five pillars and, and other pieces layered in there. So uh, you got something, share it, but it's gotta be proven to work and shown to work. Uh, so I, I, I tax dollars, as long as it teaches teachers how to teach reading and our kids learn to read. I, show me one. I'll be happy to entertain that. Senator, you're done? Okay, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think that what's missing here uh, in the, is the component that we have no, uh, <coughs> a way of mandating how higher education teaches, other than maybe Minn State, teaches this stuff. And so what becomes an issue for me is that if the University of Minnesota or the private colleges don't want to go that direction, they don't pedagogically agree or they think they have a different way of doing it, they're going to produce teachers that don't reach this mandate and there's really literally nothing we can do to make them do that. Now that doesn't mean we might be able to strike a deal in the spirit of solving problems, right? But I think that when it comes to higher education, um, those mandates don't work. We legally can't even tell the University of Minnesota what to do to begin with, for the most part. And private schools are out of our purview, other than maybe how we look at the purse strings. And so um, my suggestion, and the way I think about this, is I, I, I don't disagree with the direction of trying to find a, a, a firmer solution. And letters seems to be one of the viable options. And I think that's good, right? A firmer solution of where we're going to head on, on um, solving and addressing the issue of literacy. I, I don't think you're wrong about that. What I struggle with is that in statute, we're gonna mandate a contract that guarantees money to a private business when I would maybe suggest that what it should do is mandate money that will be selected, decided by the professionals of which way we're gonna go and doesn't mandate a specific company but mandates that we're gonna spend money specifically on this issue that's gonna have a date that it's done by. So you take out the private company and put in uh, looking at what options we have out there, whether it's um, whatever the holding company is, Veritas, or if it's some other group that uh, in Minnesota that has that, that we can utilize the same way. I think the problem is that when we, when we begin to mandate that, we have to go into statute to fix it. If Veritas goes under, or if the company's gone, but if we don't have it mandated by a particular company, but in a, a general range saying we want this done, that gives us more flexibility 
and more, in my opinion, accountability down the road to be flexible when time happens. So that'd be my suggestion to you uh, on this. I, I don't know that it's going to work. I'm not comfortable, regardless of how good they say they are, mandating the state spending money that goes right into the pockets of a private company. I think that's just not how we should do business. So thank you. Any additional questions for members? Seeing none, Senator Chamberlain, uh, final comments? Yeah. Um, I don't know what to do. The statute said you got to do it. The statute said higher ed. We have a statute that says higher ed has to do this. We have a statute said that to get licensed state of Minnesota, you had to have it. But it hadn't happened. And this is inelegant, I agree. I mean, it's not how I like to do business, but it's, I hate mandates. I think we did well with bipartisan work on dyslexia by avoiding the mandates. Uh, we put stuff in statute and uh, didn't want to mandate schools do A, B, or C, but, uh, and it's working out so far. Uh, but um, I, I asked Pelsby and MACD or whoever to come and knock on the door, give a call, and we'll sit down and figure out how, to, how we're going to solve this problem. Uh, because going forward, our teachers need to know that when they're paying the money or there's a loan out there or a state grant, that what they got, they got what they were supposed to get. And when they hit the classroom, that they know how to do what they're doing. Thousands of teachers are left out in the cold. I sincerely appreciate Mr. Shaver's testimony. I mean, I mean it's quite incredible. We left thousands of teachers proceed thinking they got something, and they didn't. And hundreds of thousands of kids, hundreds of thousands of kids left the classrooms not being able to read. Not because of the teachers. <laughs> Nobody, uh, somebody said we don't want to point fingers, neither do I. But someone come forward and f tell me what we can put in statute, how we're going to fix this problem, a commitment. And one last word is, uh, you know, Anoka Hennepin, a couple few years had a conversation with the superintendent there and the challenges and, and, uh, letters and reading dyslexia, and they they took it upon themselves to address the problem. But that's great. Bethany and 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 I, we commend them for that. And Bethany College and Bethel College have taken us on. They're changing their curriculum. So the challenge is how we get to the point of solving this problem. And um, that's all we're trying to get at here. Is this the best way? No. But <laughs> uh, we got to try something. And I think this is an uh, approach that perhaps some people hopefully will come and talk to me about because um, it's just, uh, we just can't let it go on this way. It's just, just a problem. So thank you for the time. Thank you for letting me babble. Uh, thank you for the discussion. And we look forward to working with folks to solve this uh, problem and make sure we get it right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll just lean over. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. The desire is just to lay this over. Is that correct? All right. With that, Senate File 3843 is laid over. And no other business to come before the committee? No, sir. Thank All you. All right. With that, the Senate Finance and Policy, Senate Education, Finance and Policy Committee is adjourned.